G'day! You're watching Miss Hobbs Teachers and today we're going to be learning about the reproductive system in plants and animals. Welcome back to another episode of Miss Hobbs Teachers. My name's Miss Hobbs. I am a Victorian science, STEM, business and agriculture teacher and all of my videos are Victorian curriculum aligned. Today we are going to be talking all about um, reproduction in animals and plants and we're going to be looking at both sexual and asexual reproduction in both of these. Okay, fabulous. So we are going to dive in and we are going to get started with sexual reproduction in plants and animals. Now, if you haven't already watched our cell division video, make sure you jump over there and check that one out as you might be a little bit lost without that. Now, if you think back to that video, we talked about how cells can divide through three ways, through mitosis, meiosis, or binary fission. Now, mitosis was for injury repair. Say you fell over, you, you had got an injury on your arm, um, you know, that scabs, and then it heals underneath. Now, because obviously when, you're, when you break some skin and it needs to heal, it needs to be a clone, right? Because it has to be the exact same, it undergoes mitosis. But sexual reproduction is actually conducted through our other way, which is meiosis, okay? And this is why, unless you're a twin, okay, you are different to absolutely everybody on Earth. Now, this is a bit of a fun fact for you, that human DNA is 99% identical, okay? So we're pretty much all the same, except there's a difference, okay? There's this 0.1% that we are all unique, okay? And whilst that doesn't sound like a lot, it makes a really huge difference. And that's why, um, you know, nobody else on the world or in the entire planet has the exact same genetic profile as you. Now let's recap a little bit. DNA, what is it? It stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. And we know, maybe you've watched forensic files or you've seen them do the fingerprinting, they're always looking for DNA. And DNA is unique to you. And the reason that DNA is unique to you is because of the process called meiosis. So the big difference between asexual and sexual reproduction is that in asexual reproduction, we see clones produced. Okay, so we're seeing that exact same. But when we're talking about sexual reproduction, we are going to require two different parent DNA types. And from those two different parent DNA types, we are going to see a unique DNA profile formed, um, making something which is completely individual. Now, you might be thinking, well, you know, why did humans uh, get to the point where they used, and animals, why did they get to the point, and even plants, where they used sexual reproduction instead of asexual reproduction? If we could just clone ourselves, why don't we just keep cloning ourselves? And then we can have lots of Miss Hobbses, or, you know, we can have lots of the exact same type of plant or flower, or we can have a lots, lots of the exact same cat, right? Now, there is some problems with this. And this comes down to genetic variation. If everybody on the world was the exact same as you or the exact same as me, there would be no genetic variation, okay? And the issue with that is if there was a disease which you were really prone to or I was really prone to, you would get really sick and everybody on the world would die, okay? So, so that's a bit of an issue and it's the exact same in plants, okay? Now, this genetic variation is really advantageous, especially, okay, when we are thinking about plants um, and animals, okay? So you can take um, wheat, for example. Now, there was this disease which happened actually when wheat first got introduced to Australia when it was planted up at Sydney Cove, and it's called rust. Um, and what happened was all this wheat got rusted and it wasn't able to be used, which Obviously, big panic, uh, how do we make bread anymore? How do we make pasta? Like really sustenance, okay? They were probably making bread rather than pasta. But besides the point, okay? All of their wheat crop got wiped out due to this rust epidemic. Now, what, what can happen is you'll see maybe a couple grains here and there didn't actually get wiped out, okay? 
that's because they have a tolerance to rust, okay? So by having all of these plants planted, we could go and select which ones have a tolerance and then breed from them, okay? And that would be advantageous for us because that genetic diversity we had before, even though lots of them got wiped out, the fact that some of them still remained meant we could go pick them off and then use that, okay, to select a variety which is tolerant. So you can think that from an evolutionary standpoint, okay, that that it's really useful for us to have different genetic information from each other. And actually, when we talk about coronavirus, that's the reason why some people get really sick and others don't get as sick is because we have this genetic variation. And the way that coronavirus actually gets into the human body and into cells, well, some people naturally have less of that receptor. Because remember how we talked about that um, cells bind to receptors and stuff happens, right? That's what happens. Coronavirus gets in, it's a virus, and it can bind to receptors, and it makes you sick. But some people don't have as many of those receptors, okay? And that means they're not going to get as sick or they've got a really reduced likelihood of getting it. It's why in some people, you know, mum and dad have been living together. Dad's got the virus, but mum hasn't, yeah? So genetic variation can be really, really good. So we want genetic variation in a population. It's going to help that population survive. Um, and that's why genetic variation is so essential. And that's why sexual reproduction is key, okay? Because by having different genetic material, okay, merge together to create unique offspring, we're going to increase our genetic variation and in turn, we're going to increase our survival rate. Okay, so we know what happens in meiosis is we've got our two parent cells and they are going to essentially um, combine to form the unique um, daughter cells. Okay, so we know that that's what happens and check that video out if you need a recap on that. Now, these parent cells, which are able to provide this um, different genetic information and that are able to combine together, are what we call gametes. So that's our parent sex cell information. And in plants, our gametes are our pollen and our ovule, so part of our flower. So in plants, our gamete, our male gamete is our pollen and our female gamete is our ovule, which is within the flower, okay? But in animals, our male gamete is our sperm and our female gamete is our egg, okay? So I'll recap that in plants, our male gamete is our pollen. In animals, our male gamete is our sperm. In females, our um, our gamete is the ovule, which is in the flower. And in, um, in animals, our female gamete is our egg, okay? So flowers, from that, you should know that flowers are the reproductive organs of plants and they produce these gametes. So some flowers actually contain both the male and the female reproductive systems but some only contain the female and that's why we then know that the male is the pollen, okay? That the male gamete is a pollen and that's why bees play a really important role in carrying this pollen and pollination. So when we are talking about our, our flower being the reproductive part of our plant, we call this together the carpal. Now what happens is our, is our pollen lands on top, on top of the stigma, which is quite sticky, so it allows the pollen to stick. The long stalk that the stigma is sitting on is called the style, and our ovary, which contains our ovules, is located at the base of the flower. And these are those gametes, okay? So this is what's going to allow for meiosis to occur. Now in plants, which also have the male organs, our male organ is called our stamen, okay? And this is composed of an anther and a filament. So the anther is going to produce our pollen, which is containing the male gamete. Remember, the pollen is the male gamete. And the filament is these fine hair-like stalk, which is gonna be holding the anther up. So then we're going to have our little cross-pollination part, okay? Which is going to allow for the sexual reproduction to occur within our plant. 
Now, in animals, our sexual reproduction is using our male gamete of our sperm and our female gamete of our egg cell. And this is going to form what we call a zygote. Now, in males, the sperm cells are produced in the testes and in the females, the eggs are produced in the ovary. Now, the process of the egg and the sperm cell, so our gametes fusing together, okay, in meiosis, is what we call fertilization. Um, and this can occur either inside or outside the body. Now, when this is occurring inside, um, this is called internal fertilization, okay, so in many mammals. But when it's occurring outside, this is called external fertilization. So they're the two terms that you need to be using there. So most aquatic organisms use external fertilization. So the gametes, the sperm and the egg are released into the water, okay, and the fertilization occurs when these two meet. Now, the thing with external fertilization is, is there's no effort required, right? It's released out into the water and then it's let go. The issue with this is there's actually quite a low success rate. So often a million gametes will be um, released into the ocean from one single animal to ensure that fertilization does occur. Now, most land um, organisms use what we call internal fertilization. And internal fertilization is really important to be conducted on land because otherwise our male gametes would dry out, okay? So it's really important for fertilization to occur that um, animals um, and organisms which are on land are using internal fertilization rather than external because there's not that same likelihood of them being able to meet. Internal fertilization requires a higher level of investment than external fertilization from the parents. Um, however, it does have a higher success rate. Okay, so let's just recap that. We have our external fertilization, which is occurring mainly in sea animals, in marine life, um, that is occurring outside the body. Um, there's a small energy investment, but also a low success rate, whereas our internal fertilization is occurring on land organisms um, within side. It has a high parent investment rate, but a high, and a high success rate. Okay, let's just finish up with this one. So we've talked about that meiosis is the process of sexual reproduction. Um, we see sexual reproduction in both plants and animals. Um, in throughout all of these, we see gametes, okay? We need male and female gametes in both plants and animals in order to see um, se a successful reproduction. Some plants have both male and female um, parts, whereas, whereas some only have female organs. Our female reproductive structure is a flower which has our female gamete of the ovule, whereas our male gamete in plants is our pollen, and our pollen may or may not okay, be directly um, produced by our own plant. And this is why pollinization is really essential. When we are talking about this pollinization in animals, though, we are calling it fertilization. We know that the testes are producing the male gamete of sperm and the ovaries are producing the female gametes of the egg. And we see either internal or external fertilization, internal fertilization within land animals, which has a high success rate, but high parent input. And we see external fertilization in sea and marine life, which has a low parent um, input rate, but also a low success rate. Thanks for watching this episode of Miss Hobbs Teachers. If you found this video helpful, give it a thumbs up. Uh, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell to get notified when the next video is released. Thanks for watching.